sorry everyone, technical glitches. So yeah, so as I said, so what I aim to present on today is, is, is two aspects. So firstly, uh, what's missing from the current literature? So while there's a um, considerable amount of research into methods to shift circadian rhythms, both in animals and humans in the laboratory, there's only a moderate amount of research in the, into the performance of airline pilots in the field. And as you can see, a very limited amount of uh, information on the responses of athletic performance to travel. And then secondly, address two key questions surrounding travel. So firstly, um, following long haul travel, when is it best to schedule training? Uh, not only f to ensure quality of training, but also to reduce the risk of injury. And then secondly, are there any methods that we can use to improve the rate of recovery and therefore get, into tr get back into training sooner? So I'm going to, this slide will come up a few times in the presentation, so no worries if you don't take it all in at the moment, but it's basically to highlight the pathways through which travel may impact performance. Um, whilst I acknowledge there are other factors, as I'll pre present to you today, um, these may be the most, import the most important ones. So when, when we travel across time zones, east or west, then we get the effects of both jet lag and travel fatigue. Whereas, we're, whether, whereas, whereas whether, when we're traveling long haul north or south, so crossing no time zones, it's just travel fatigue on its own. So just a bit of um, a, b a brief recap on, on jet lag. So this, this diagram here shows how human circadian rhythms, so the daily pattern of uh, rhythms in um, biolog biological factors such as melatonin and, and body temperature, how they're usually in synchrony with uh, external cues. So for example, an increase in melatonin and reduction in body temperature in, in, um, together with uh, darkness initiates sleep. However, following, following long haul travel, th there's a loss of synchrony between the internal circadian rhythms and the external cues. Whilst these external cues, so particularly the light dark cycle, gradually resynchronize your circadian rhythms to the new time zone, jet lag symptoms such as increases in daytime fatigue and sleep disruption are likely to continue until full resynchronization occurs. So since there's been uh, an association between uh, circadian rhythms in body temperature and performance um, has been reported, this loss of synchrony that I'm talking about may have a direct impact on performance. So in particular, the timing of peak performance may change following long haul travel. And this is highlighted by a study, study done by the uh, late, great uh, Tom Riley here. So this will work. Yep. So as you can see, on day one following long haul travel, leg strength is as its peak in the, in the morning and then um, is reduced in the afternoon. However, by day seven, which is the um, blue triangles here, performance returns to its normal rhythm of a morning nadir and an afternoon peak. An individual's chronotype may also impact their time of peak performance. So this is a good study done by a group at the University of Birmingham recently. Um, and they, no surprise, showed that morning larks, time of peak performance is in the, is in the morning, whereas night owls, their time of peak performance is, is in the evening. However, they also, also showed that morning larks' performance is likely to be optimal around five hours following their, their internal time since a train, in trained awakening. And then for night hours, this is up to 11 hours. Okay, so again, I'm gonna, this diagram will come up a few times during the presentation, so I'll just run through it, through it now. So it's basically showing an example of travel from Australia to Qatar. So the time at the top is Australian time, I think Adelaide time, and then the time at the bottom is the equivalent Kateri time. The, um, the green dot shows the peak in uh, core body temperature, whereas the red dot shows the uh, nadir in core body temperature. So based on those previous study, what my first bit of practical advice is that um, you can use an estimate of the circadian rhythms in body temperature to 
determine which is which time is best to train following long haul travel. So, for example, as I said, there's a, an association between the the body temperature rhythm and performance, and performance is likely to be greatest around the time of uh, peak body temperature. So this is this um, this time. So this is around five o'clock Australian time, but in the morning Qatar time. So following travel from Australia to Qatar, the best time to train in terms of quality of training may be in may be in the morning. And then you can also potentially use an athlete's chronotype. So obviously the chronotype affects the time of peak performance, and therefore you could use their chronotype to again determine which, which time is best to train following travel. So given the role of uh, melatonin and body temperature in regulating sleep, another way, how, oh, another way that travel may impact performance is through sleep disruption. So this particular study highlighted that 30 hours of sleep deprivation resulted in a greater amount of uh, perceptual fatigue prior to exercise. This had a negative impact on pacing strategies and reduced intermittent sprint performance. The author speculated this could be due to reduced motivation to perform at high intensities following sleep disruption. Thus, travel may impact performance through this pathway, so through sleep disruption, an increase in perceptual fatigue and reduction in motivation to perform at high intensities may then impact performance. So again, by going back to this diagram, because following westward travel, peak body temperature is usually in the morning, uh, Qatar time that is, S um, early waking is likely, so a typical response following westward travel is early waking. However, the opposite occurs following uh, eastward travel. So you can see here, so this is Qatar back to Australia. Core body temperature is in the, uh, yeah, obviously the evening Qatar time, but this is, is late night uh, Australian time. So a typical response following eastward travel is that um, sleep onset is likely to be delayed. However, it is worth noting that these are just estimated responses and there's very little information on the sleep patterns of traveling athletes. So on to a practical advice number two. So based, based on this would be to utilize sleep hygiene uh, interventions following long haul travel across time zones. These guidelines are well established and have recently been published in an edition of the Aspertar Journal. Um, so on to the symptoms of jet lag. So how can we measure the symptoms of jet lag? So this may be assessed through this questionnaire that was developed by um, the group at Liverpool John Moores. And I'd just like to take a moment now just to acknowledge the, the, amount and the amount of work that they've done in this area. They've really been sort of pioneers in the, the area of travel research and have, have really advanced the field. Um, so this questionnaire not only um, assesses jet lag itself, but also assesses symptoms related to jet lag. So the effect of travel on sleep, fatigue and mental performance, uh, meals, uh, sorry, diet and, and, your, and your bowel movements. So it's estimated that following um, westward travel, it takes half a day per time zone crossed for circadian rhythms to adapt and for jet lag symptoms to disappear. The opposite, so following, sorry, following eastward travel, it takes a bit longer. So it takes one day per time zone crossed um, for your circadian rhythms to adapt and um, jet lag symptoms to disappear. But again, this also may, may be modulated by an individual's chronotype. So it's been suggested that morning larks may adapt better or adapt easier to eastward travel, whereas night owls may adapt better to uh, westward travel. But what, so that's just estimated responses again, what actually, what actually occurs. So, we recently did a study with the Australian national football team traveling, from, traveling obviously from Australia to Brazil for the 2014 World Cup. So they crossed 12 time zones eastward. So based on the estimate, it would take them 12 days to adapt and for jet lag symptoms to disappear. But as you can see from this graph here, that was quite different in reality. So by day five, jet lag symptoms are almost, almost disappeared from day five. 
So there's quite a, there's potentially quite a discrepancy between what's estimated based on an understanding of chronobiology and what actually happens in reality. And then based on this figure, so this basically shows the number of days it takes for different variables such as sleep, jet lag, performance to adjust following travel. And as you can see, performance is likely to be reduced until circadian rhythms have adapted and jet lag symptoms have disappeared. Thus another way through which travel may impact performance is through jet lag symptoms such as increased daytime, time fatigue, daytime fatigue, um, were, were reduced motivation, etc. Okay, so moving on to travel fatigue now. So travel fatigue, slightly different to jet lag. It is, um, it's induced by the demands of travel itself. So this can include the plain microclimate, so mild hypoxia, the prolonged exposure to mild hypoxia and dry air, uh, the cramped conditions and prolonged inactivity, and the, disrupt and the resulting disruption in sleep patterns and nutritional intake. I do acknowledge here that there are other factors, um, such as the effects of mild hypoxia, the impact of travel on hydration, uh, hematology, and nutrition. But for, for, ti for time's sake, again, I'm going to stick to my uh, initial, initial diagram and, initial, and the initial pathway. So, again, the first way through which travel fatigue or the demands of travel may impact performance is through disturbed sleep. And since uh, long haul travel can enforce travel times of up to 24 hours, both phases of the sleep wake cycle are likely to be encompassed. So, sleep can be disrupted during travel through. The flight schedule, for example, stopovers often, often occur in the middle of the night. Uh, meal time, so you may be woken from sleep for, for, for meals. Uh, the noise levels, so that the engine noise or uh, crying children, uh, and the cramped conditions and, th and that those, their effects on uh, sleeping position. So practical advice number three is to also utilize sleep hygiene guidelines during, during travel. Now at the bottom here, so there's a bit of a debate at the moment on when is actually best to sleep during uh, long haul travel. So it's suggested that you should sleep during travel according to when it is night at the destination. Um, however, in reality this could be difficult to do because your circadian rhythms are still aligned with the departure time zone. So you're trying, if you're trying to sleep at the night at the, at the time of night at destination, then you're trying to sleep when your circadian rhythms are keeping you awake, and alternate and yeah, conversely, you're trying to stay awake when circadian rhythms are trying to induce sleep. So potentially, it may be better to time sleep during travel according to when it's night at the place of departure, particularly because sleep is likely to be disrupted during travel anyway. However, there is no research on this yet, so yeah, it's still 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 undecided and a study that needs to be done. So travel may also um, increase the risk of illness. But uh, as highlighted by Professor Neil Walsh in his uh, talk a few weeks ago, sleep disruption itself, again, um, may, may, cause, may increase the risk of illness. And this, again, highlights the central role that sleep disruption may play in the effects of travel on performance. So this is a great study by uh, Martin Schwellness and published in the BJSM, which showed that um, there was an increased risk of illness following outbound but not return travel in elite rugby players. So the study suggested that the increased risk of illness around travel may not be related to factors, sorry, is more likely to be related to factors at the destination, um, such as food and exposure to, to new pathogens, rather than factors um, during travel, such as close proximity to other travelers. In another study published in BJSM um, with Norwegian Winter Olympic athletes, indicated that the use of simple preventative measures, such as hand sanitization and coughing into the elbows and not the hands, led to a reduction in the incidence of illness between two Winter Olympics. So from 17% in Torino 2006 to 5% in Vancouver 2010. 
that's practical advice number four and following on from uh, Professor Neil Walsh's talk is to utilize these simple preventative measures pre, during and following travel to try and prevent uh, the re uh, to reduce the risk of illness. So lastly, just touching, uh, touching on injury. So a study in um, rugby sevens players. So they looked at the effect of long haul travel on injury rate in rugby sevens players. And they found uh, no, no uh, effect of um, the long distance travel on injury risk. Though to my knowledge, this is the first study that's really looked at this. So again, it's a, another area that requires further investigation. So on to performance. So there currently are only, there's only been four published studies that have assessed um, the, so the main aim of the study was to assess the effects of an episode of air travel on the recovery timeline of performance. There's a number of reasons for this. Cost is obviously one, and then secondly is the logistics of conducting such a study. Because of these logistics, these studies have often used um, performance measures that are questionably related to uh, performance on the field, such as, such as grip strength, um, though it's worth noting here that they, the reason they have used grip strength is also to look at, the, again, going back to Tom Riley's study, the circadian rhythms in, in performance. Furthermore, there's few studies that have assessed, um, have assessed the, the, this particular pathway and its, its impact on performance. So the first take-home message is that there's currently a limited understanding of the timeline of sports-specific performance recovery following long-haul travel in elite athletes and the associated mechanisms. So we've attempted to address some of these limitations in a series of recent studies where we've utilized the Yo-Yo Intimate Recovery Test, which has been validated with the phys physical demands of, of team, sport team sport performance. So in the first study, w bit of a busy diagram, but so I'll just go through it. So we took a range of performance, physiological and perceptual me uh, measures, both prior to and in the two days following 24 hours of simulated travel. So what I mean by simulated travel is that we simulated the seating arrangements and activity levels and the mild hypoxia typically experienced during commercial airline travel as, as shown in this picture here. And in, ad in addition to that, we also simulated the travel schedule. So that included a stopover and the timing and composition of, of, of meals. In a follow-up study, we did the same thing, but then there was an intervention group that also utilized sleep hygiene measures both during and following travel. So in the first study, so the demands of travel led to an increased sleep disruption or led to sleep disruption. This increased both physiological and perceptual fatigue, which led to a reduction in intermittent sprint performance. In the second study, though we were successful at reducing sleep disruption and perceptual fatigue through the sleep hygiene interventions, this had no impact on performance. However, the limitation of these studies obviously are that it's simulated travel, so we're, we're only assessing the demands of travel and not the disruption of circadian rhythms. So again, in a recent study, we attempted to address this. So what we did was we measured performance Oh, great. Sorry. I'll just show it. My apologies. I'll just explain it basically. So you can see the timeline at the bottom there. So what we did was we measured performance uh, in the four days prior to and um, following outbound travel from Qatar, sorry, Australia to Qatar. And then we did the same thing on the way back. So we get, again, we measured performance prior to and following return travel between Qatar and Australia. 
Oh, now it's working. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. So, yeah, performance for four days prior to and four days following outbound travel and then prior to and following return travel. And we measured performance both in the morning and the afternoon. So this figure shows the change from baseline in um, intermittent sprint performance. So on day one, two, three, and four post-travel. So following both west and, and east travel. And as you can see from the figure, intermittent sprint performance was reduced in the first three days falling eastward compared to westward travel. So though we observed a reduction again in intermittent sprint performance in this study, as we're still analyzing the data, so we collected all measures related to all, all these pathways, we're still analyzing the data. So hopefully if I don't mess this up too much, I'll be allowed back to present you the results um, as and when I have them. So practical advice number five is that um, intermittent sprint performance may be reduced up to 72 hours following long haul travel. And then this is obviously gonna have a Im potential impact on training scheduling. So on to inter interventions now. So it's suggested that only, the only way that you can, to, the only way to avoid jet lag is to start adjustment of circadian rhythms um, prior, prior to travel. So this is a, a suggested schedule for adjusting circadian rhythms prior to travel from Chicago to London. However, as yet, the efficacy of this, and there are a few logistical issues, the efficacy, efficacy sorry, of this in elite athletes in the field hasn't been studied. So there's potential, but hasn't been studied yet. Back to sleep hygiene again. So because sleep loss is likely during and following long haul travel, then it's a good idea to make sure s that good sleep ha habits are followed prior to travel and that athletes are showing up for long haul travel not in a sleep deprived state. So follow following travel, whether to adjust your circadian rhythms is based on your duration of your stay. So the general guidelines are that for short stays of like one to two days, um, adaptation is, is not suggested and instead term, um, methods to maintain daytime alertness such as uh, naps and caffeine uh, are suggested instead. However, for stays of greater than four to five days, then adaptation of circadian rhythms is suggested. So how do we go about doing this? So this figure here basically shows the optimal times to, uh, to apply certain interventions to cause shifts in circadian rhythms. And there's a couple of things to note here. So firstly for light, the maximum shifts occur around the core body temperature minimum. And obviously the time at which you apply the intervention, so either prior to or following the temperature minimum will affect the direction that you adjust circadian rhythms. Melatonin, maximum effects occur around the melatonin maximum or the dim, dim light melatonin onset. And then just to note the simula similarity between timings for light and exercise, which I'll come back to in a bit. So this is probably the, the simplest intervention that can be suggested because no uh, specialist equipment is required. However, natural light um, is not always available. Um, so in, in these cases, artificial bright light may be used to supp supplement natural light and this can be done through either light boxes, so on the right here, or these funky looking um, light glasses. So again, I'll, I'll use this study a couple of times in this section, so I'll just go through it quickly. So it's a study that looked at um, the effect of light exposure and melatonin on their own and combined on basically shifting circadian, ry circadian rhythms in, in a laboratory-based study, so under stringently controlled conditions. And they, they showed that light exposure, I think it was artificial bright light exposure, was effective at shifting circadian rhythms in this scenario. However, a different story in the field. So this study, again, by the Liverpool John, John Moores group, so they looked at the use of um, light boxes in the USA women's soccer team traveling from America, sorry, from yeah, America to the UK. Um, and they, they found no effect of the intervention. This may be because 
of some of the compromises they had to make to implement the intervention. So that included the players sharing light boxes and also reducing the time of exposure um, because of team commitments. So in this scenario, the artificial light, gla light glasses may, may have been more effective because obviously you can, you can walk around with these on, whereas a light box, you're, you, you, you have to stay in your room and, and stare at that. So. so then practical advice seven. So again, going back to this diagram. So just shows basically that, that the timing of light exposure following westward travel is prior to the core body temperature minimum and then to avoid exposure following the core body temperature minimum. So again, the greatest effects occur in the three hours prior to and the three hours following. Just of note here though, because depending on the number of time zones you cross will obviously affect the, the timing of the intervention. And while it would be great to expose them to light on all these days, obviously we're getting quite close to bedtime here. So we've only used it on the first day because then circadian rhythms will start to shift and you've got to apply light later and later, and this is going to have an impact on sleep. So that's obviously not desirable. Then the opposite is required for west, uh, eastward travel. So light exposure in the three hours following and light avoidance in the, in the, in the period prior to the core body temperature minimum. So melatonin may have both hypnotic and so hypnotic, so sleep inducing and chronobiotic, so phase shifting, sh phase shifting effects. So again, in this study, in the lab, it was showed to, shown to be effective at shifting circadian rhythms. Sorry. So, but however, so two recent reviews, including the Cochrane review, have raised questions um, regarding the usefulness for melatonin to reduce jet lag symptoms. And this is highlighted in, in this study, again, another study by the Liverpool John Moores group. Um, Excuse me. So in the field, they used melatonin, and though 40% of the participants' circadian rhythms shifted in the, r the correct direction, 50% shifted in the wrong direction, and 10% had no change. So sort of ten tentative, of tentative practical advice number eight is to utilize three to five milligrams of melatonin, which is typically used in studies. Um, so following westward, travel, melatonin administration in the morning, body clock time, so this time here may be effective. And then following we uh, eastward travel, melatonin administration in the evening, body clock time. However, there are examples of um, sort of over, either over-reliance or abuse of uh, prescription med medication by elite athletes. And therefore, practical advice number nine is obviously to use pharmacological interventions with caution. Uh, and that behavioural intervention should be uh, potentially be preferred over pharmacological ones. Also to note that with melatonin, the, the correct dose and the pharmacokinetics is, is imperative. So if you have too high a dose and melatonin is in the system for too long, then similar to the, the Liverpool John Moore study, then it could cause phase sh shifts in the wrong direction. So what about combined intervention? So Back to this study again, which again, so what, what it showed was that light exposure and melatonin in combination were actually more effective at shifting circadian rhythms than light exposure and melatonin on their own. This has led to the publication of these combined uh, intervention exposure schedules. So this is a, a proposed schedule traveling from the UK to Rio. And you've got here, so the times to avoid light and exercise times to seek light and exercise, and then the best uh, melatonin dosing strategies. However, again, though it has potential, the, these, in, these um, schedules haven't been tested in the field um, in randomized controlled trials, and particularly with elite, elite athletes. So practical advice 10 is uh, related back to the first figure I showed you, and the, the fact that the, the optimal timings for light exposure and exercise are quite similar. So a simple intervention could be combi combining light exposure with training um, following travel to shift circadian rhythms. Sorry. Before, I go, so before I go on to the next slide, so basically because of our limited understanding of the timeline of performance recovery following travel and associated mechanisms, um, interventions are currently 
designed and based on an estimated travel responses or an understanding of chronobiology and, and not on, on actual travel responses. And though, so the take home message number two is that though these interventions are sound in theory and may have efficacy in laboratory based studies, to date they have limited impact in the field in field based studies with elite athletes. So what can we do about this? So before I finish, just touch on um, what could potentially be done to improve the efficacy of these interventions. And that is to, to individu individualize the intervention. So at the moment, all, the in all interventions are, are applied generically. So what this does is this assumes that the rate and direction of adaptation of circadian rhythms following travel is generic, but actually it's individual. So the rate, and the rate and direction of adaptation of circadian rhythms will differ depending on the individual. So how can we potentially individualize the interventions that we're using? And, and, and one method is through the use of uh, sort of improving technology. So through core temperature monitoring um, and, and, and through, th through this method and this, this, this technology, we can basically um, monitor core body temperature with instantaneous feedback. So we could produce something like this. So this is the, the daily rhythm in core body temperature on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then from that, calculate obviously the core body temperature minimum and how it shifts in each individual following travel and therefore apply the, the intervention based on, on, a, on an individual basis. But again, there are potential logistical issues with this. So then further research needs to be done um, in order to test its e efficacy in not only field-based studies, but with, with elite athletes. So just to summarize, um, because of our limited understanding of the timeline of sport-specific recovery and the associated mechanisms, we're, we're currently, un currently interventions, the field-based efficacy of interventions uh, are uncertain. And this limits, limits us to a, um, rather generic uh, practical recommendations. Whereas if we improve our understanding of this time, uh, of what's happening in, uh, around travel, particularly in athletes, um, this may improve the efficacy of these interventions and then we can make more targeted, specific recommendations. And that's it. Thanks very much for your attention.